Your Royal Highnesses, distinguished and honored guests, it gives me great pleasure here today to talk to you about the future, your future. Now, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. Let me say that I'm a physicist, and I've had the privilege of interviewing over 300 of the world's top scientists for this book. So let me quote from that great physicist, Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr once said, quote, Prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. Let me also quote from that other great scientist, Woody Allen. Woody Allen once said, quote, Eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. Now, I'm a physicist. What do we do? We invent things. We invented the laser. We invented the transistor. We helped to assemble the first computer. We constructed the internet. We also wrote the World Wide Web. And along the way, we also invented television. We invented radio, x-ray machines. We invented most of what you see in a hospital. Also, we helped to create the space program. We created the GPS satellites. We created weather satellites. And now we are inventing the future. So in my last book, Physics of the Impossible, I even go farther into the future, not five, 10, 20 years, but a thousand years into the future, when we might even have time travel, perhaps starships, perhaps even teleportation. But today, I want to talk about your life. What will your life look like in five, 10 years? And then Ray Kurzweil will talk about even the bigger picture. So some people say, ha, you cannot predict the future. You can't even predict the past. Nobody predicted the crash of 2008. Well, that's not quite true. You see, what is the origin of wealth? Where does prosperity and wealth come from? Ultimately, it comes from science. But science comes in waves. One invention, the steam invention, creates a cascade of secondary invention, which creates wealth, fantastic wealth. And wealth often creates a bubble, a huge bubble. And when it pops, you get a depression. So before talking about the future, let's talk about the past. Around 1800, we physicists worked out the thermodynamics of steam engines. From that, we could compute how much energy it would take to create a locomotive. That created textile mills. That created factories, railroads, tremendous wealth that we had never seen before. For the first time in history, there was a bubble, a huge bubble that formed on the London Stock Exchange, and the bubble was unsustainable, and it popped in 1850. In fact, the crisis of 1850 was so great that it even gave birth to a philosophy called Marxism. We physicists are restless too. 80 years later, we pioneered the next great invention, electricity, magnetism, the internal combustion engine. And that created a second bubble, a tremendous bubble on the American stock exchange in utility stocks, and automobile stocks. The bumble was unsustainable, and it popped in 1929, 80 years. 80 years later, we physicists created the next set of wealth, lasers, computers, transistors, the internet, and it created a bubble, a huge bubble. And the bubble in the United States was in real estate, and it popped in 2008. And even as we speak in this room this month, there's a bubble in Europe that probably will also pop. And that bubble 
was created to maintain the Mediterranean lifestyle. Well, that is also unsustainable, and it will pop sometime this year. So the question that we physicists are asking, and this is the question, what is the fourth wave? The first wave was steam power. The second wave was electricity. The third wave was high tech. The fourth wave, we're not sure. But we think it's going to be a combination. Hold on a second. We think it's going to be a combination of biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. So let's say a few things about information. And Ray Kurzweil will amplify this in his lecture. This is Moore's Law which says that computer power doubles roughly every 18 months. What does this curve mean? Today, if you get a birthday card in the mail, you open it up, and it sings, Happy Birthday to you. There's a chip in that birthday card. That chip has more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945. Stalin, Hitler... Churchill would have killed to get that chip. And what do you do with it? You throw it away in the garbage. Look at this curve. Look at 1969. We put two men on the moon. Ever see these old videotapes of the man in the moon shot? Look at those old computers. Oh, my God. You're not going to send me in outer space backed up by those computers. How much computer power did they have in 1969? Less than your cell phone. We sent people into outer space, backed up by the power of today's cell phone. And now take a look at 2020. When you start to look into the future, you now know that this curve predicts that chips will cost roughly a penny in 2020. That means you now know the future of the computer. The future of the computer is to disappear, to be everywhere and nowhere. Where is running water today? Running water is under your feet. It's in the walls, in the ceiling. Where is electricity today? Electricity is under the floor, in the walls, in the ceiling. When you walk into a room, what is the first thing you do? You look for the light switch. In the future, when you walk into this room, the first thing you will do is look for the internet portal. You will assume that the floor, the ceiling, and the walls are intelligent, and the word computer will disappear from the English language. Just like electricity. No one says that anymore. No one says electricity. And where does electricity come from? You know, the cloud someplace. Who knows where electricity comes from? So in the future, where will computer power come from? It'll come from the cloud. And where is it? It is everywhere and nowhere, including your glasses. Google recently came out with internet glasses. Other internet glasses can recognize people's faces. How many times have you been at a conference like this? and you bump into somebody, and you say, I know this person. It's Jim, John, Jake. I know this person. In the future, your glasses will say, it's Jim, stupid. Remember, you meet him every year at this conference. And let's say you're looking for a job, and you're at a cocktail party, and you don't know who the important people are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. Right next to their name is their biography. And if they speak Chinese to you, compliments of Google, it will be translated into your language as subtitles beneath that person's image. Now, maybe you don't want to look like a refugee from Star Trek. In the future, it will be fashionable. Children are the driving force behind this technology. In fact, video games is a bigger industry than all of Hollywood movies. That's how big this industry is generated by children. Now, there's several ways you can do this. 
You can shoot the image directly to the retina of your eye, or the lens of your glasses can be used as a screen, or the military uses an eyepiece. They flick down an eyepiece. And eventually, fashion models will wear these things. Eventually, at fancy parties, people will be able to download movies, download documents, teleconference, right there in your glasses. But there's a problem. Let's say you don't wear glasses. Let's say you don't like glasses. Then what are you going to do? You will blink and you will go online. These internet contact lenses, who will be the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students studying for final examinations. <laughs> they will blink and instantly they'll see all the exam questions right there in their eyepiece. Who else will buy these internet contact lenses? Actors, actresses, politicians. Politicians will never say anything stupid again because their script is right there in front of them. Who else will buy these internet contact lenses? Artists, architects, they'll wave their hands and 3D printers will print out beautiful buildings, homes, works of art, simply by waving your hands in, in, the, in the air. Who else will buy these internet contact lenses? Tourists. If you're in a foreign country and you don't speak the language, that's a problem. How can you buy anything unless you speak the language? In the future, we'll have universal translators giving you subtitles as people speak to you. And if you're in Rome, you will see the Roman Empire resurrected from the ruins of the Roman Empire. In China, in the Summer Palace outside Beijing, that Summer Palace has been resurrected in the same way. Artists have illustrated the Summer Palace of 1860 before it was burned down by the British and the French. So who will want these internet contact lenses? Everybody. Now, what is this called? This is called augmented reality. Virtual reality is for children. Virtual reality is when you put on glasses and there's a cartoon. There's a cartoon inside your glasses. That's virtual reality. This is for adults. This is called augmented reality. And it's not a new idea. In fact, there's a Hollywood movie a Hollywood movie which introduced people to augmented reality. What was that Hollywood movie? Well, here is the former governor of California in a very bad mood. It's the Terminator robot. And when the Terminator robot sees John Connor, there's a biography, a biography next to his name. So in the future, you will always know who you are talking to. You will always know what they are saying. And this applies to all aspects of industry, commerce. Let's say that your husband sometimes does the shopping, but your husband always buys the wrong thing. In the future, when you send out your husband, the image in his contact lens will be sent to you at home you will see what he is seeing and he will always buy the right thing. If you're a boss, you will see what your staff is seeing when they make an inspection overseas because what they see in their contact lens can be broadcast immediately to the boss. This is going to change the way in which we do everything. If you're an astronaut, in outer space and you're making repairs, you don't have time to look at the blueprint. Boom! You see the blueprint right inside your contact lens. And the military has its own version. I flew down to Fort Benning, Georgia with the Science Channel and we filmed this. It already exists. This is not science fiction. The military version is this big. It is half an inch long. It fits on your helmet or your sunglasses you flick it down and immediately you're online. 
the internet of the battlefield. This is already operational. You see enemy forces, friendly forces, artillery, armor, all of that right in your contact lens. And how will you pay for all of this? In the future, money will be digitalized. For example, music is already digitalized. And there's a warning here. The music industry was told that one day music will be digitalized. And the music industry said, ha, people will always buy music the old fashioned way. They will always go to the store and buy a disc. They will always buy a stereo of some sort. Wrong. You know who controls the music industry today? It's amazing. The company which controls the music industry today is Apple Computer. Apple Computer controls the music industry. That's what happens if you ignore technology. So in the future, when you want to buy something, you simply point and click. Point and click. In Japan, you can already do this. You can go to department stores in Japan, point and click, and it could be your wristwatch. It could be your jewelry, whatever. You point and click. Money becomes digitalized in the future. And this is what your cell phone looks like in the future. Today, if you try to type a message on your cell phone and you have fat fingers, sorry about that. You can't type on a cell phone. In the future, you'll scroll out intelligent paper. This is e-paper. Every dot in e-paper is a transistor. You can scroll out as much paper as you want from your cell phone to create a screen, a keyboard, or anything you want. And this is the future of your living room. We can create yards, yards of intelligent paper. And this is the future of wallpaper. Because remember, chips cost a penny in about 10 years time. Now today, if your wallpaper is old, discolored, ugly, what do you do? You suffer. What can you do? Your wallpaper. In the future, you talk to your wallpaper and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Please change color right now. Here's your wallet of the future. Screens are flexible and they move. They move. Here, it, what, what newspapers might be like in the future. And this is your living room. This is your living room of the future, surrounded 360 degrees. And this is called the cave. The cave is when you have four walls surrounding you. And I took a film crew from the Science Channel. We flew to the University of Maryland. They actually have a cave. Four screens show images of dinosaurs. They put me in the middle, and I was in the middle of a dinosaur fight with dinosaurs coming at me in all directions. In the future, at a football game, you will see yourself right in the middle right in the middle of a football game because you'll be surrounded by this technology. This dog over here, by the way, is a virtual dog. It plays with your children, runs, barks, plays with your children. However, it doesn't exist. It is a virtual dog. In fact, this is creating a problem for the English language. We have a contradiction in terms as chips go into toys, as toys become more intelligent. That contradiction in terms is smart Barbie dolls. That's a contradiction in terms. Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft works. <laughs> that is also a contradiction in terms. And in the future, if you are a college student on Friday night, and you have no date, you're lonely, it's Friday night, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go to the wall screen and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's available tonight? Boom! Your wall screen sets you up because it knows the kind of person you like. And then you see a movie like Casablanca with Humphrey Bogart. But then you say to the mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall. 
please remove Humphrey Bogart's face and put my face instead. You will be the hero of every single action movie. And even farther in the future, let's say you're a stamp collector. Let's say you're a coin collector and you want to meet other coin collectors outside. What do you do? You sign up for a service, a dating service, a stamp collector service, whatever. And as people walk by you, their faces light up. Their faces light up in your contact lens because they too are coin collectors. They too are stamp collectors or they too want to meet a date for Friday night. So in the future, when you want to meet somebody for Friday night, what do you do? You go outside. This is the future of television. People have always wanted 3D TV, but it never happened. Why? You have to have those glasses, those awful glasses to have 3D. Well, we physicists said, now wait a minute. We can use optics to create 3D without glasses. It's called lenticular technology. This screen is no ordinary screen. This screen consists of thousands of vertical lines, thousands of vertical lines. Each vertical line is a prism. It cuts the image in half. One half goes to the left eye, one half goes to the right eye, and boom, 3D without glasses. This is going to be in your living room in the coming years. Already, if you play video games, you know that the first video games hit the market this year with lenticular technology. And this is also the future of glass. This is your window of the future. Your window of the future is intelligent because chips only cost a penny. You simply talk to the window and the window changes. If you want to see the Eiffel Tower, you want to see the Taj Mahal, boom, you just talk to it. So this is how 3D TV works. If you look down on the TV, these are vertical lines. This cuts the image in half. One half goes to the left eye, one half goes to the right eye. And that's how you have 3D television without glasses. The key is the screen. This is your office of the future. As we said before, chips cost a penny. Why should your office be based around a PC? The only place that we will find a PC in the future is in a museum. These are disposable computers. You simply scribble on them and then throw them away. They only cost a penny. But the scribble follows you in the cloud. As you go from room to room, room to house, house to home, home to car, car to office, the files follow you in the cloud. So. Think of water. Where does water come from? Well, a lake, a reservoir someplace. But how do you access water with a faucet? That's all you need is a faucet. The water comes from a, re a reservoir or a lake. The same thing with computer power. In the future, your appliances will be faucets. Faucets that access a lake called the cloud. And this is your cubicle of the future. It'll be beautiful. Gorgeous, three-dimensional. It'll be so beautiful, you will never get any work done in the future. And this is how you will drive in the future. This is a car of the future that drives itself. Today, we know that people get tired. They fall asleep. They get drunk. In the United States alone, 40,000 Americans die every year needlessly on the highway, what we need are cars that use GPS that drive themselves. I had a chance to drive this car. BBC television flew me down to North Carolina and they put me in this car. There I was driving the car, having a wonderful time with the sports car. Then the cameraman said, let go of the steering wheel. And I said, what? Are you crazy? I'm not going to go the steering wheel. And the cameraman said, trust me, let go of the steering wheel. So I closed my eyes and I went like this and the car drove itself. Now, after today's talk, 
Let's do a science experiment. Get in your car and go like this and see how far you get driving your car. But that is how you will drive your car in the future. GPS is good for about six inches, roughly six inches. That's the air. There are radar, radar in the fenders. And these cars have been tested. In fact, the Pentagon even had a contest with these cars. These cars are safer than human cars because humans get distracted. Humans fall asleep. These cars do not. And as I mentioned, 40,000 people die needlessly. So in the future, the words traffic accident, traffic jam will disappear from the language. Computers, no one will say the word computer anymore. No one will say the words traffic accident anymore. Then how will you buy things in the future? Today, if you go to a dress store and you see the perfect dress, right color, right shape, right design, everything's perfect, but wrong size. What happens today? No sale. In the future, you whip out your credit card. Your credit card has your precise three-dimensional measurements. You send it to the factory. The factory punches it out and boom, the next day you get it in the mail. Everything will fit in the future. This is called mass customization not mass production. In fact, Henry Ford of Ford Motors was the one who popularized mass production. Henry Ford was famous for saying, quote, the American people can have any color car they want as long as it's black. In the future, you'll have anything you want in any color, any shape, any size because of mass customization. And this is how you will pay for things. When you go to a store today, you don't really know how much things cost. Supply and demand, yeah, that's nice. It's a theory. The theory says that when supply equals demand, that's the cost. That's what things cost. But even Adam Smith said, this is imperfect. People don't really know what something really costs. And... In the future, we will have something called perfect capitalism, not imperfect capitalism. When you walk into a store of the future, your contact lens will scan all chips, scan the chips in all the goods that you see, and tell you immediately who has the cheapest product, who has the best product, how much does it really cost to make something. So the advantage shifts to the consumer. The consumer knows everything about anything simply by looking at their contact lens, scanning all the chips, because chips cost less than the barcode, and finding out what things really cost. So if you're the manufacturer, how will you fight back? You will fight back because of data mining, targeted marketing, positioning, and branding. So if you're a company owner, knowing that the consumer knows everything. No, the consumer knows that your product is not the best product. Your product is not the cheapest. How will you fight back? Advertising, branding, positioning, data mining, targeted marketing. That's how the producer will fight back in the future. And of course, service, courtesy, that one-to-one -one human interaction could seal the deal. That's also going to be even more important in the high-tech age. So remember, in high-tech age, you have to have high-touch as well as high-tech. So now let's talk about an even bigger revolution, bigger than anything we've talked about. We talked about music. Music is digitalized. Money is being digitalized now. The next industry to be digitalized is medicine. This is going to change everything. And as David Baltimore once said, Nobel laureate, all medicine, he said, will be reduced to computer science. So let's talk about medicine. How small can you make a chip? We can make a chip so small, you could put it inside an aspirin pill with a TV camera and a magnet. You swallow it, and it goes down taking motion pictures of your insides. 
because we all know what middle-aged men fear the most. Middle-aged men fear the C word, colonoscopy. And this gives new meaning for the expression Intel inside. In the future, Intel will always be inside. And let's talk about cancer. Believe it or not, we can now attack cancer cell by cell. This is undergoing human trials right now, not monkey trials, not mouse trials, human trials right now, as we take molecules, arm them with poisons, and they seek out individual cancer cells and kill them. One way, for example, is the following. A cancer cell has holes on its walls. The holes are large and irregular. A normal cell has small round holes. Cancer cells have large raggedy holes. We can make a molecule halfway between the two, too big to fit in the small hole of a healthy cell, but small enough to fit right into a cancer cell and kill it. That's one of several mechanisms we have of killing cancer cells one by one. And in the next slide, you will see the miracle weapon that will reduce the word tumor and kick it out of the English language. The next device will conquer cancer because of prevention. Watch. It is your toilet. In the future, your toilet will tell you that you eat too much, too much sugar, too much salt in your diet. Isn't the future wonderful? Even your toilet will tell you that you eat too much. But in this toilet, there's a chip. This chip has all the power of Silicon Valley. These chips are so tiny, they capture DNA. That's how small they are. They can capture DNA fragments from cancer cells, identify cancer, and tell you that you will have cancer in 10 years' time. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computer, died of pancreatic cancer. All the doctors say it's aggressive, incurable, unstoppable, kills you in three to four years. But the genes for pancreatic cancer were sequenced just a few months ago. We found out that that is actually wrong. The cancer which killed the founder of Apple Computer is a slow-growing cancer. 20 years for it to form a tumor which kills you. But only in the last three years do you feel it. You don't feel anything for 17 years, but it's growing inside your body. So in some sense, Steve Jobs died too early. Because with these DNA chips, we can detect cancer years before it forms. So in the future, your toilet will say, you have cancer. Do something. You have 20 years. And in the future, by the way, we can also make mirrors in your bathroom. Bathroom mirrors with DNA chips. This already exists. You blow in it. And when you blow on it, it detects the moisture and calculates if you have a mutated P53 gene implicated in 50% of all common cancers. Your bathroom mirror will tell you if you have lung cancer. The word tumor could disappear from the English language. And MRI scans are like the tricorder of Star Trek. But MRI scans are huge. Whoops. MRI scans are huge, gigantic. Why? Why do MRI scans have to be so huge? And the reason is the magnetic field has to be uniform. These are called Helmholtz coils. They have to be extremely uniform. But we can use computers to compensate for a weak, irregular magnetic field. In Germany, two physicists invented the world's smallest MRI machine, fully operational and it's the size of a briefcase. Scientific American interviewed these German physicists and they said, how small can you make an MRI machine? And the answer is this big. You will have in your cell phone more computer power than a modern university hospital today. And you will have it very soon 
the power of an MRI scan inside your cell phone according to the laws of physics. And what will we do with this information? We will scan your DNA. Today it costs $1,000 to have every single gene in your body listed. This is an owner's manual for your body. Your laptop, your PC, they all have an owner's manual. Everything you have has an owner's manual except for one thing, you. You have no owner's manual. You will have that owner's manual. And what will we do with it? We will grow organs of the body as they wear out. This is an ear. It's made out of plastic. It's biodegradable. You take cells from your own ear, stick it inside, they proliferate, forming a perfect ear, then the plastic dissolves. This is bone on the left. We can now create almost limited quanti unlimited quantities of bone. This is cartilage on the right. Ears, noses on the right. And this is the first bladder an entire bladder grown from your own cells. We can grow heart valves, blood vessels, bones, skin, cartilage, noses, ears with today's technology. And in five years time, we hope to grow the first liver. So in the States, I always say, for you alcoholics in the audience, take heart. We will grow new livers of the body. So as I tell my American audiences, drink up. And even the brain, we're now beginning to crudely image the brain as it thinks. This is the brain on the left as it tells the truth, not much happens. But when you tell a lie, your brain lights up like a Christmas tree when you tell a lie. Because you have to know the truth, you have to create the lie, and you have to calculate the consistency of the lie with all the previous lies you've been telling all these years. That's a lot of brain power. And we can now hook up at Brown University a stroke victim who is paralyzed. We put a chip right here, right here at the sensory motor cortex, stick it to a computer, and this person who is paralyzed can now play video games, surf the web, write email, answer email, do crossword puzzles, and he is paralyzed. And here's my colleague, Stephen Hawking. He can only blink. That's all he can do. So scientists hooked up a single channel EEG sensor on his right frame of his glasses. Look at his glasses. There's a single channel EEG sensor, picks up brain waves, and allows him to communicate with the outside world. And then, of course, the aging process is the big one. Is it possible that we can stop the aging process? Well, at the present time, probably not. But in the future, there's a definite possibility because we now know what aging is. We didn't even know what aging was a few decades ago. Aging is, in one word, error. Information error. The buildup of error. The accumulated errors in our genes, in cellular debris, all that error makes cells work slower. They get sluggish. That's why skin cells start to sag. That's why muscle loses tone. That's why bone becomes brittle because air build up. But we can now replace, we can now accentuate air correction mechanism. The body has its own air correction mechanism. For example, I didn't know this till I interviewed quite a few biologists. Did you know that some animals never die? They simply age forever. I didn't know that. The animals which don't age are alligators, crocodiles, some sea turtles, and the female flounder. They never get old. They just get bigger, but they never age. Now you, say, you might say to yourself, ha, that's not true. I mean, everybody knows that alligators, look at the internet, they live to be 70. But you see, that's when the zookeeper died. No one has ever seen an alligator age. They simply get bigger. Now in the forest, the swamp, they do die. 
uh, disease, predators, accidents, starvation. Yeah, they die. But in the zoos, they don't die. And take a look at our chimpanzee, our closest evolutionary neighbor. We are 98.5% equivalent to a chimpanzee, but we live twice as long. And we are smarter than a chimpanzee, but only a handful of genes separate us. Now, before I give the microphone to Ray, let me just make one last parting comment. When I was a child growing up, I had a childhood hero, and that was Albert Einstein. And my favorite Einstein story is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him and he said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache and a wig. I will be the great Einstein and you can take a rest and be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. And this went along famously until one day, a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great audience. Thank you. Your Royal Highnesses, honored guests, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I've been enjoying your Abu Dhabi hospitality, and we did a little sightseeing today. We saw the Grand Mosque, which is quite magnificent. And I've been learning a lot about your country and, and city. I think Abu Dhabi is making the right kinds of investments. I'll talk a little bit about what those are. But I'd like to expand on uh, Dr. Kaku's presentation. I think it's a very good introduction. We, we should talk together more often. Uh, because I'd like to give you a broader perspective. I believe these things are going to happen. Many of them are underway already. Why is it happening now? Why didn't these things happen 50 years ago or 50 years from now? Uh, what is the pace of change? Where does it come from? It didn't come from nowhere. So I'd like to give you a little bit of a sense of the history of technology and why we are now entering really the most exciting phase of human history. And I became interested in this because of my own interest in being an inventor. Uh, that's what I have always thought of myself to be since the age of five. I remember my parents gave me lots of enrichment toys, things like erector sets, lots of toys with lots of little parts. And I, I assembled all my parts in different uh, rows, and I had lots of different things I could put together. And then I went through the neighborhood and brought back radios and bicycles and took them apart. And I had this big inventory of things I could put together. And I had this idea that if I could just figure out how to put them together in the right way, I could create transcendent effects, magical effects. I didn't have that vocabulary at age five, but I, I can remember the feeling very well. And I remember other kids were wondering what they were going to be, a nurse, a teacher, a fireman. And I always had this conceit, well, I know what I'm going to be. And I've kept, kept that interest for over half a century. But I discovered 30 years ago that the key to being successful as an inventor was timing. And it turns out timing is important in everything in life, in investments, professional work, your personal relationships. You have to be in the right place at the right time. And so I began to study from a scientist's perspective, what can we predict about the future? And I had the idea, which is still a common assumption that you cannot predict the future. The, f the future is unknowable. But I thought maybe if I studied it, gathered a lot of information, I could make some reliable predictions that would help me to make sure my inventions made sense, not for the world I saw in front of me, but the world that would exist two, three, four, five years from now when the project's finished. And that will be a very different world. 
I mean, think back now, three, four years ago, people didn't use social networks. Look at how influential they are today. Uh, wikis like Wikipedia, blogs. Ten years ago, most people didn't use search engines. That sounds like ancient history. That wasn't so long ago. The, the, the world changes very, very quickly. And if, you, if your project's going to take a while, it has to make sense for that future world. So I gathered a lot of data, and I made a very surprising discovery. If you measure the basic measurements of information technology, the kinds of technologies that Michio was talking about, they actually form very predictable trajectories. You can actually predict where the power of computers will be, the power of communication technologies, now the power of biological technologies, which are becoming information. And that was really very surprising. And not only is it predictable, but what's predictable is that it grows in an exponential manner. It doubles every period of time, depending on what you're measuring. The overall power of a computer right now is doubling uh, actually in less than a year. And even that rate is getting faster and faster. If you look at computers 100 years ago, it took three years for them to double in power for the same cost. In 1950, it was two years. In the year 2000, it was one year. Now it's 11 months. But even just doubling every year is pretty fantastic because there's a very profound difference between exponential growth and linear growth. Now, linear growth is like this, one, two, three, four, five. That's actually what our intuition tells us. The reason we have a brain is to be able to predict the future. So when our ancestors walked through the field a thousand years ago and they saw, oh, there's an animal going that way, I'm going this way, we're going to meet up there. I don't want to meet that animal, I'm going to go this other way. Turned out to be good for survival, to be able to predict the future. That became hardwired in our brains. But those predictors that are hardwired in our brains, are what we call our intuition, is linear. The things are going to keep going at the same pace. But the reality, not of everything, but of information technology, is that it doubles every period of time. Instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it goes 2, 4, 8, 16. And they might think, well, it doesn't sound that different. But a linear progression, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, at step 30, you're at 30. 2, 4, 8, 16, an exponential progression, at step 30, you're at a billion. And this is not an idle speculation about the future. This is several billion times more powerful for the same price as the computer I used when I was a student. It's 100,000 times smaller. So when I came to MIT, in fact, I went there because it was so advanced in 1965 that it actually had a computer, and thousands of us shared this one computer, took up half a building, cost tens of millions of dollars. This is thousands of times more powerful. And we will do that again in the next 25 years. This will then become the size of a blood cell. It'll be a billion times more powerful again for the same price. And it gives you some idea of what will be feasible. And that is actually a very predictable trajectory. And so I've been making actually predictions based on this. I didn't start a week ago. I started 30 years ago. In, uh, in 1981, I had uh, a number of the curves that I will show you showing this exponential progression, very smooth, of computers, of communication technologies. So I saw the Internet, which wasn't called the Internet. It was called the ARPANET for the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Department of Defense in the United States. And it was just set up to allow defense department scientists to communicate with each other. There are only a few thousand scientists in the whole world who are using the ARPANET, but it was doubling every year. And for various reasons, I, I was quite confident that would continue. So I said, wow, this is going to be a World Wide Web connecting hundreds of millions of people around the world to each other and to vast knowledge resources. And people thought that was nuts. It got a lot of criticism. The entire American defense budget can only tie together 2,000 scientists, so maybe someday there'll be hundreds of millions of people. That's going to be hundreds of years away. But that is, in fact, exactly what happened because of the power of exponential growth. In 1990, the Genome Project was announced. Uh, this was not a mainstream project. A few renegade scientists actually saw that th this was progressing exponentially. I agreed with them, and we all felt that it would take 15 years. 
But mainstream science has said there's no way you're going to sequence the whole human genome in only 15 years. Because in 1989, we only collected one ten thousandth of the genome. This is going to take centuries. Halfway through the project, the skeptics were still going strong because only 1% of the human genome had been sequenced. So they're saying, okay, seven years, 1%, it's going to take 700 years, just like we said. My reaction was, no, we're almost done. Once you get to 1% in an exponential progression, that's only seven doublings from 100%. 1% a year later would be 2%, then 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Seven years later, it should be finished. And that's exactly what happened. And as a result, health and medicine is now an information technology, as Dr. Kaku talked about, and I'll talk more about that. And this exponential pace of information technology is fueling an acceleration. It's making things go faster and faster, particularly the impact of technology on our lives. The very first invention in human history was a communication technology. It was called spoken language. We could actually tell stories to each other. That took hundreds of thousands of years to evolve. The second invention was written language, so we could actually write down and record our message and actually write down human knowledge. That took tens of thousands of years to evolve. Then we invented the printing press. Uh, that took 400 years to reach a mass audience around the world. The telephone reached a quarter of the US population and a very good portion of the rest of the world in 50 years. The cell phone reached a quarter of the worldwide population in seven years. Today there are more cell phones than people in the world. Social networks, wikis, blogs, search engines, the personal computer, uh, those reached uh, a quarter of the population in three years. So there's a continual acceleration. Things are getting faster and faster because of this exponential growth. So I'd like to show you just a few examples of this. Uh, we, I have now a team of 10 people that gathers data in different areas of inf inf information technology. We have hundreds of these graphs. I'll show you just a few examples of just how amazingly predictable this is, even though you would think that it would, it would be very unpredictable. So this is the first graph that I came up with. I had it through about here, 1980, in 1981. These are, each of these dots is a famous computer going back to the 1890 American census. And this is not just Moore's law. Moore's law says that we can put twice as many transistors on a chip every two years. They run faster, so it's actually a doubling in power every one year. But that only pertains to chips, which started actually in the 70s. Uh, this goes back uh, several generations earlier long before we had chips, long before Gordon Moore was even born. And what was amazing is how smooth a progression this is. Now, this is a logarithmic graph, meaning when, what we're measuring, which is the power of computers per $1,000, constant $1,000, uh, expressed in an exponential manner. So as we go up the graph, we're multiplying by powers of 10. So every level on this graph is 100,000 times greater than the level below it. A straight line on a logarithmic graph is exponential growth. And you can see it's actually a curve. It's better than exponential growth. So it looks like a modest little curve, but this actually represents trillions fold improvement in the amount of computation you can get for the same cost. That's how we're gonna get these penny per chip computers, that's just a calculation by continuing this curve into the future. But what's really amazing is look at how smooth the progression that is. It's extremely predictable. And as an example, in 1980, I completed this curve, and none of these, none of these computers existed at that time. Uh, and as the future has unfolded, all of the computers that have come out have been on that curve. It's been very predictive. Uh, I had this curve in uh, 1980, I, I finished, I extended it to 2050, we're now at 2012, and uh, it continues to be very predictable. 
But it's quite revolutionary. This is a several billion-fold increase in the power of computers since I was a student. And it's going to give us billions more capability in computers and every other example of information technology as we go forward. So I don't want to dwell on these examples of electronics, but this is the cost of a transistor. When I was a high school student, I would hang out in New York City. I would go to the surplus electronics shops. They're actually still there. And I'd buy something this big, which was a telephone relay, that could switch one bit of information. It cost $50. Uh, then I was excited in 1968, I could buy a transistor, which was much smaller and faster, for only one dollar that did the same thing. Today you can get billions of them for a dollar, and they're faster again. Uh, the cost of a transistor cycle has been a very smooth exponential down, being basically half as expensive every year. That's a 50% deflation rate. This act, and this is true of every form of information technology. You want to buy a million instructions of, of comp computation. You want to send a million bits wirelessly. Uh, you want to send a million bits on the Internet. You want to sequence a million base pairs of DNA. It will cost you half as much today as it did a year ago, a quarter as much as it did two years ago, one thousandth as much as it did ten years ago. That's actually deflation, and that's actually what's holding inflation in check. Uh, economists actually worry about deflation. In the, in the uh, worldwide depression we had in the 1930s, we had massive deflation. But, and the concern is, if you can get the same stuff now for half the price of what it cost you last year, okay, you will buy more. That's an economic rule that comes out of the uh, price uh, supply uh, curve. But you're not going to double your consumption because you only need so much. So maybe you increase your consumption 50%. Therefore, the size of the economy is actually going to shrink as measured in constant currency. But that's actually not what we see. I mean, here's bits of memory shift, but I could show you 50 other graphs like this. We actually more than double our consumption every year. And in fact, uh, the total amount of currency consumed by information technology has increased 18% per year every year for the last 50 years, despite the fact you can get twice as much of it each year for the same cost. And the reason for that is as price performance reaches certain levels, whole new applications explode. I mean, why didn't search engines take off 20 years ago? Is it because nobody thought of it? Nobody thought it was important? All the price performance didn't exist. As price performance becomes feasible, things like iPhones suddenly explode or digital music, or any of the other applications uh, once they become cost effective. And this is actually what's fueling economic growth around the world. So Time Magazine had a cover story on this idea. They, they said, hey, we want you to put this particular computer that we covered in the magazine a few weeks ago on the graph. I said, well, it may not be on the curve. It's not going to be above the curve, but it might be below, because sometimes computers come out that are below industry standard, and then they don't survive in the marketplace. But indeed, it's the last point there. It's right on the curve. This is a curve that I fashioned, uh, extended 30 years ago. It remains remarkably predictable. Uh, this here is the number of bits we move around wirelessly in the world. So a century ago, there was Morse code over AM radio. Today's 4G networks. And, and this is a logarithmic scale. Every level on this graph is a thousand times greater than the level below it. And again, you might think that this would be very erratic because if you read the headlines, you know, multi billion dollar telecommunication company goes bankrupt, new auction of spectrum space, one country accuses another of dumping products. You would think that given the unpredictability of human behavior that this would be very erratic. It's, it's amazing how smooth uh, these curves are. The internet data traffic, this basically shows a doubling every year, the number of bits we move around on the internet. Uh, here's that graph that I had in the 1980s. I had the first few points here. This was called the ARPANET. So I 
predicted it out and said this is going to be a worldwide web of hundreds of millions of people by the late 1990s. And that's exactly what happened. This is the same data, but this is not a logarithmic scale. This is a linear scale. And this is actually how we experience the world. So to the casual observer, it looked like the World Wide Web just came out of nowhere. But you could actually see it coming. And this is actually the main advice. I do some mentoring now of young companies. And we actually have those companies, okay, write down in your business what are the parameters that affect your business. Like right now I have a company that does e-books. And so we're concerned about the resolution of displays and the power of mobile computing and telecommunications. So we will actually write down what those technologies will be like one year from now, two years from now, three years from now. And even though I've been doing this for 30 years, I'm surprised, wow, telecommunications is going to be that different in two years? You really have to actually write it down and compute it uh, in order to really anticipate it because a lot of business plans that I read assume that the future three years from now, five years from now, it's going to be just like today. Maybe cell phones will be a little smaller. But people, we just don't have the imagination unless we take the, this discipline. Uh, but these trajectories are very predictable. So biology, uh, I mentioned the total amount of genetic data has doubled every year. It's continued past the end of the Genome Project. The cost of sequencing DNA has come down by about half every year. Uh, and basically, we are learning the software of life. And that's not a metaphor. It's not an abstraction. There are literally little software programs running in our body, 23,000 of them. They're called genes. And we actually have the technologies now to change them. How long do you go without updating the software on your phone? This is probably updating its software right now as I speak. But I'm walking around with outdated software that evolved thousands of years ago. For example, I have one gene, and I bet you have it too, called the fat insulin receptor gene. Basically it says, hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well. And that was a very good idea a thousand years ago. You worked all day to get a few calories. There were no refrigerators, so you consumed your prey, and then it stored it in the fat cells of your body. And that was a good idea then. I would like to tell my fat insulin receptor gene now, you don't need to do that anymore. I'm confident the next hunting season will be good in, in the supermarket. And uh, so that was actually tried near where I work in the Boston area, the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. They turned off that gene. We have technologies that can turn genes off, like RNA interference. So they turned off that gene, and these animals ate a lot. They ate ravenously, every, all they wanted, and they remained slim. And it was not a fake slimness. They didn't get diabetes. They didn't get heart disease. They lived 20% longer. They got the benefits of caloric restriction while doing the opposite. Uh, and they're working with a drug company to bring that to the human market. There are genes we've identified that are needed for cancer to progress or heart disease. There are genes we'd like to add, and we have techniques to do that, uh, for example, I'm working on a project where we take cells out of the body, lung cells, scrape them out of the throat. These are in patients who have a disease caused by a missing gene. Now, most people here have that gene, but if you're missing that gene, you will get a fatal disease called pulmonary hypertension where the life expectancy from diagnosis is about one year. And really, all they're missing is this one gene. So we take one of their cells in a Petri dish and add that gene, inspect in the special microscope that it got done correctly, then we replicate it millions fold. So now we have millions of cells with the patient's own DNA, but with the gene they're missing, inject it back in the body, goes through the body, ends up back in the lungs, and this has actually cured this fatal disease, and it's undergoing successful human trials. These are just a few of the hundreds of examples where we're basically reprogramming our biology. Uh, my father had a heart attack in 1961. Uh, it damaged his heart, so he could hardly walk. In fact, 50% of all heart attack survivors have a damaged heart. It's called heart failure, the low ejection fraction. Uh, and the heart does not fix itself. Uh, today, you can actually get these stem cell 
therapies and have that fixed uh, by rejuvenating the heart with your own heart cells that have been programmed to basically rejuvenate the heart. Uh, and we're going to be, as Dr. Kaku mentioned, growing new organs. Uh, there's no longer a, a, a problem with embryonic stem cells because we can take our own skin cells and create the equivalent of an embryonic stem cell by adding four genes. They're called induced pluripotent cells. And the ethicists who are opposed to embryonic stem cell research because it involves embryos uh, support this type of work because there's no embryos. And if you need a new kidney or a new liver, you'd like it to have your own DNA. So these are just a few of the ways in which we're treating health and medicine as an information technology. And the significance of uh, that now that it's an information technology, it's going to progress in this exponential manner. These technologies are getting twice as powerful every year. That was not the case uh, in the, using the old method, which is really hit or miss, just accidentally finding things that work. So if I want to send you a music album, a few years ago I would send you a package and you'd get a box and you'd unwrap it and there was a music album. Today I can send you an email attachment with a link or with files to download and I can send you music as an email. Uh, if I wanted to send you a book a few years ago, I'd send you a package. Today I can send you an email attachment. I can send you a movie as an email attachment. Well, now I can send you a violin as an email attachment if you have the three-dimensional printer. And this is not a future technology. This is, exists today. This is a real violin that was printed out on a three-dimensional printer. Uh, this was on the cover of a recent issue of The Economist magazine, and uh, professional violinists have played it, and it plays quite well. Somebody printed out an airplane uh, one module at a time and snapped it together and flew in it. Uh, I have a university I started with uh, Peter Diamandis. It's sponsored by Google and NASA. The American Space Agency gave us a campus in Silicon Valley, and the students do team projects. One of the projects is to use three-dimensional printers to print out housing whole houses for the developing world that are very high quality but low cost, printing them out again one module at a time and snapping them together. Uh, this is ultimately going to revolutionize manufacturing. Right now we're kind of right before the storm. It's like before search engines or before uh, you know digital music. Uh, the tech, not all the capabilities that we want are in place. Uh, but it's improving very rapidly. The costs are coming down. The resolution and fineness of features are increasing. You can already print out quite complex objects with these three-dimensional printers. And, of course, we can print out whole organs, printing out the scaffolding with a three-dimensional printer and then actually populating it with uh, the necessary stem cells, as you saw on the video, to actually grow uh, any organ in the body. This will be applied to medicine. Uh, here we see uh, these are little robotic red blood cells. Uh, our red blood cells are little devices. They store oxygen and carbon dioxide. They release them in a certain manner. Uh, this is a device that's designed to do the same thing, but it's a thousand times more powerful. And a calculation was made that if you were to replace a portion of your red blood cells with these little robots called respirocytes, you could do an Olympic sprint for 15 minutes without taking a breath or sit at the bottom of your pool for four hours. And uh, so, honey, I'm in the pool. will take on a whole new significance. Uh, I was asked by ESPN, the sports magazine in the United States, we're going to ban these, right, just the way we ban steroids. And I said, probably not. We should ban steroids because steroids are bad for your long-term health. So if you don't ban them, you're forcing athletes, in order to be competitive, to do something that's damaging to their long-term health. So there's a moral reason to ban them. And the, fact, and the fact that we don't actually enforce that very well means we actually do have that problem. But this is actually good for your health. You could have a heart attack and you'd have hours to get to the doctor. It will lead to better oxygenation of your tissues. So th let me talk a little bit about a project that I've been very interested in, 
actually for 50 years, I started thinking about this when I was 12, uh, how does the human brain work? And how can we actually copy its methods and create artificial intelligence and then use that artificial intelligence to make ourselves smarter? And I've been thinking about that for 50 years. And we're already making progress in that. Just using a search engine uh, makes us smarter. The fact that I have a device in my pocket that I can access all of human knowledge with a few keystrokes makes me smarter. Ultimately, uh, we will continue to get smarter, and we will ultimately put them inside our bodies to make ourselves healthier. They'll go inside our brain. They'll put our brains on the Internet. Uh, but even if we just carry them in our pockets, they are making us smarter. And we really have not been able to see inside the brain with enough clarity to tell how the brain works. Uh, there are MRI machines, and so... Dr. Cocker showed you a picture of what happens when somebody lies, and you see certain things lighting up, and we can tell certain things, you know, from which area is active. So uh, we'll look at someone, and if they're looking at a loved one, one area lights up. Uh, if they're looking at something that's scary, another area lights up. It kind of tells you where things are happening, but it doesn't tell you how it works. But the, the precision and uh, resolution of brain scanning has also been improving exponentially different kinds of brain scanning. We can now actually see inside a living human brain with enough precision to see individual interconnections being formed. And what we've always thought poetically, we find now is actually true. Not only does our brain create our thoughts, but our thoughts create our brain. As we think about things, we're actually creating new connections. And so it's said you are what you eat, but it's, it's even more true that you are what you think. So you should, in fact, be careful who you hang out with and what ideas you're exposed to because we are creating uh, connections in our brain. We're creating our brain with everything that we are exposed to. And I'll give you, in just a few minutes, a, a brief summary of how the neocortex works, which is the part of the brain uh, where we do our thinking. It constitutes about 80% of the brain. Only mammals have a neocortex, and it's biggest in a human being. Uh, our primate cousins, like chimpanzees and monkeys, have a neocortex, too. It's almost as big as humans. It doesn't have this big forehead with this frontal cortex. It gives us more neocortex. That was enough for us to create science and art and literature and, all the, and, and uh, technology, all the grand creations of, of humankind. And the neocortex basically is a pattern recognizer. It recognizes patterns. And so consider, for example, that uh, letter there. That's the letter A, and has a little crossbar in it. So I've got 300 million pattern recognizers, and most of them are trained to recognize certain patterns. At a very low level, they're recognizing very simple patterns. So I've got a bunch that are just trained to recognize crossbars, like the crossbar in that capital A. So I look at that, and that pattern recognizer lights up and says, aha, I found a, a crossbar in a capital A. I've got other pattern recognizers that recognize other parts of the capital A. They feed up to a higher level. See, so I'll show you that. So the, at the lowest level, there, I have different pattern recognizers that are recognizing these different parts of a capital A. It goes to the next level, and there there's a pattern recognizer that goes, aha, a capital A. And that goes to an even higher level, and that recognizes uh, the word apple or the word pear, depending on what else I see in the environment. Uh, our, these pattern recognizers are organized in hierarchies. That's cl That's a key part of the neocortex. It's really the only brain structure that's organized in this hierarchical manner. And it can recognize any number of levels of this hierarchy. So what happens if we go up, you know, more levels, 50 more levels? What kind of patterns are we recognizing there? Well, we recognize things like, oh, that's beautiful. Uh, that's inspiring. That's scary. That's funny. Uh, now, you probably think that those recognizers that are recognizing these abstract qualities 
must be much more complicated than these simple ones. They're actually the same. They just exist at a different conceptual level. Now, where do these connections come from that tie these different recognizers together in this pattern? Well, I was not born with this. I wasn't born knowing English and the languages I don't know, which I have, which I can't recognize. We learn this. That's part of the human paradigm. To get from being a newborn baby to a 20-year-old that actually can command language and can recognize that things are beautiful uh, takes, takes a long time. And a key strength of the neocortex is that we can create these connections ourselves. In fact, we have to. We're not functioning human beings if we don't create them. And that's the essence of the theory. And I talk about uh, how we can relearn things, how we can keep our mind open, because actually by the time you're 15, you've completely filled up your brain. So if you want to learn anything new after age 15, you've got to actually forget something that's old to be able to learn something that's new. Um, and this technique, it turns out that the techniques we've evolved in the field of artificial intelligence are very similar to what goes on in the brain. And it's not because we were copying the brain, because we couldn't actually see inside the brain until just recently. Uh, but those are the techniques that seem to work. Uh, biological evolution discovered the same thing. So in the few minutes I have left, I want to talk about the impact of all of this. Uh, technology, as I mentioned, is progressing in an exponential manner. It's getting more and more powerful. It's progressing faster and faster. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Now, I think there's a lot of optimism here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, as I travel around the world, uh, the opinions are mixed on this issue. Some people think the world is getting worse, and they think technology is responsible. Things were much better. People were happier before technology kind of wrecked our lives. Uh, I think that's kind of a romantic notion. I think people who say that don't really know what life was like. 200 years ago, you can read writers in, in English, people like Thomas Hobbes or even Charles Dickens, describe what life was like 200 years ago when life expectancy was 37, when there were no social safety nets, not because people weren't liberal enough or because there wasn't enough money to go around, and life was extremely difficult. Uh, but I actually have about 50 graphs like this. I'm going to just show you one example of what has happened to humanity over the last 200 years. So these little circles are countries. The ones that I know about is, this is China. You might actually, I'm gonna show you then what happens over 200 years. You might keep an eye on China because it does some interesting things. And we're gonna look at these countries on two dimensions, health and wealth. So wealth is income per person. And this is measured in American dollars today, so actually 2009 American dollars. So the income per person on average was in the hundreds of dollars. People were quite poor in general. Uh, there is a range. There were wealthy countries and less wealthy countries. There's, there's an income disparity, but nobody was very wealthy at that, at that time. On the y-axis, its health is measured in life expectancy. So most uh, people lived into their 20s or 30s. Av the worldwide average is 37 in 1800. So what happens over 200 years? So this is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, machines were being introduced. It started in the English textile industry in Britain. Uh, other countries started experimenting. As we get to the 20th century, the 1900s, you'll see a wind that carries all these countries towards the upper right-hand uh, part of the graph, towards greater wealth and greater health. And at the end of this process, there's still a disparity between the wealthiest countries and the less wealthy, uh, <clears throat> but the countries that are worst off are much better off than the countries that were best off at the beginning of this process. And it's not the end of the process. In fact, it's speeding up. As these technologies continue to grow exponentially, this is going to continue to move towards greater health and greater wealth. Uh, we see the same thing in education. Uh, we are destroying jobs at the bottom of the scale ladder. 
uh, and creating new jobs at the top of the skill ladder. And the new jobs have to do with creating knowledge and creating information. They require more education. Uh, they pay ten times as much in constant currency as the jobs uh, that are being eliminated. And we're investing more in education. That's certainly true here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, if you look at American statistics, we're spending ten times as much per child in constant dollars on K-12 through as we did a hundred years ago. In 1870, there were 50,000 college students in the United States. Today, there's over 10 million. And if we look at worldwide education, the number of years of schooling that an average child receives, okay, this is the developed world and this is the developing world. There's a gap, but they're both moving in the right direction. We've tripled the amount of education a child gets in the developing world. We've doubled it in the developed world over the last 50 years, and that's continuing to move in this direction. So all these different measures of, of considerations that are associated with human happiness, education, health, wealth, are moving in the right direction because of this progression in information technology. And in my view, it's going to get faster and faster because of the exponential growth of these technologies. Uh, there, now sometimes people say, well, if people are going to live longer, we're going to run out of resources. Uh, we actually have plenty of resources if we can untap their power with the same technologies they are going to extend human longevity. Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, and I did a study for the National Academy of Engineering in the United States on energy. We analyzed different energy. So this is energy uh, methods. This is just one example of solar. The cost per watt is coming down very quickly because we're applying nanotechnology to solar power. Uh, the total amount of solar power is doubling every two years. Uh, it's now actually only seven years, seven doublings from meeting 100% of the world's energy needs. But th this is just one example. There, there are new energy technologies that use fossil fuels that can extract it inexpensively and with no environmental impact. There's many different ways in which we can harness energy, and we actually have thousands of times more energy than we need uh, to meet all of our needs with these new technologies. The same thing is true of water, new food production techniques, housing using things like uh, putting houses together using three-dimensional printing. We'll have plenty of resources for an expanded population. So this is the progress we made in life expectancy. It was actually less than 20 uh, thousands of years ago. We've quadrupled life expectancy in the last thousand years. We've doubled it in the last 200 years. This is before health and medicine was an information technology. This is just from the hit or miss process of finding things that happen to work. Now that health and medicine is an information technology, this is going to go into high gear. And it's not just living longer, it's living better, overcoming many forms of suffering, being able to stop and reverse aging, uh, and also just improve other parameters of life. And so if I, I'm sometimes asked what is my advice for preparing for this future world, for individuals, for cities, for countries, societies, I would make a few observations. First of all, it's very much an interconnected world. We, uh, you know, no society can just say, well, we're going to take care of ourselves and you know, we see every, people are concerned about what's going to happen in Greece. I mean, when I, in 2008, I happened to be traveling around the world uh, in October, and within one week, every industry in every country was, was affected negatively, but it shows that everybody is connected economically, uh, and that's going to continue to be the case. Uh, the best investment are twofold, education and, and in future technologies. And that's, I'd make two points about education. One is it's not just for children. Of course, it's very important to educate children. But the old model where we'd educate kids and they, be, they learn a, a trade to be a carpenter, uh, a policeman, uh, maybe a nurse, and then just do that for 40 or 50 years and then retire, that model is already obsolete. Uh, people are going to have to continue to learn new things because the pace of change is going to be so rapid. So education needs to be a lifelong pursuit. And the best way to learn is to actually learn from doing. 
the old model of education where we just sort of stuff facts into kids' minds is also obsolete because we carry the, the facts in our pockets. Uh, what children and adults need to learn is how do you find the right information? How do you apply that information? How do you actually solve problems in the real world using all the information that's available? How do you create new information? <clears throat> and the best way to learn that is to actually try to do it. Uh, I mentioned Singularity University, which I started. is backed by Google and NASA. And the main philosophy we have is that the students actually do projects they take on big problems, like solving the water problem for the world, or disease, or housing. And the goal is, in fact, for these projects to continue long after the students have left the university. The goal is to actually positively affect a billion people within 10 years. And the uh, idea is then to apply these exponentially growing information technologies to solving these problems. Now, many of these projects are, in fact, underway and are doing very well, like applying three-dimensional printing to developing housing for the developing world and other important areas. So some of these projects really will succeed in helping these uh, grand challenges of humanity. Uh, others may not succeed in that, but they'll learn something anyway. If I think about what I've learned in my life, some of my projects have got, been successful, others uh, have not been so successful. I've learned from all of them. And in fact, that's where I've learned what I know today is from the pro from actually trying to do things in the real world. And there's a version of that that can be brought into education uh, at every level, including elementary school and certainly uh, college level. We see college kids starting great companies like Google or Facebook. Uh, and I think the tools of creativity are now in everybody's hands. Uh, but I think the investments that are being made in Abu Dhabi in education, in the technologies of the future, are, are the right approach. Uh, I think uh, if we all continue to invest in these areas, we'll see a very bright uh, and happy future for humanity. Thank you very much. You can have a seat, please. Uh, we'd like to welcome again on stage um, Dr. Macheo. والآن ندعو المتحدثين لاستقبال أسئلتكم. يرجى تدوين أسئلتكم على البطاقات الموجودة على مقاعدكم وتسليمها إلى المنظمين. Um, for our English-speaking uh, audience, uh, please write down your questions on the cards provided on your seats and uh, uh, give them to our volunteers uh, around uh, this stage. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for uh, being here and uh, giving us this amazing um, kind of insight on what to expect in the future. Um, this uh, first question we have here is uh, for Dr. Kaku. Uh, how can you stop or slow down global warming using these technologies and how far uh, are you from a time machine? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, global warming, I don't think can be easily reversed. Mm -hmm. We've tried to look at uh, carbon sequestration. Some people have talked about shooting missiles into the clouds to darken the atmosphere. Personally, I think it's gonna be difficult. We have to change the way we produce energy on the planet Earth. Now, solar power is dropping in, in price, as, as Ray mentioned. I think in uh, five, 10 years, it could be very competitive. Right now, solar power is more expensive than fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. and, but I think in the next 10 years, there will be chaos, uh, chaos in the energy market. Now, beyond that, beyond 10 years, we have a non-polluting source of energy, which is fusion power. The French and the European Union are investing 10 billion euros creating the ITER fusion reactor, which uses the power of the sun, fusion from the sun, hydrogen fusion. The basic ingredient is seawater. Seawater has hydrogen, and you can burn the seawater to create electricity. Mm -hmm. However, maybe 10 years, uh, 2019, it is supposed to become operational. To make it commercial, it take another 10 years so minimum of 20 years before we have fusion nuclear power plants, 
But that is non-polluting, no carbon dioxide being created. It's unlimited. That is, we use seawater as the basic fuel. The problem is it doesn't exist yet. So it's a dream. But if the French and the European Union dream pays off, we could have almost unlimited energy almost for free. And that would then cure the global warming problem. Mm -hmm. I'd make a comment on that. As I mentioned, I did a major study of different energy sources for the National Academy of Engineering with Larry Page. And we looked at different scenarios, a number of them which are already working at some level uh, can more than meet our energy needs. For example, solar, there's 10,000 times more sunlight that hits the Earth and we need to meet all of our energy needs. We need to capture one part in 10,000. Uh, that certainly will be feasible within a decade and the total amount is doubling every two years. But there's also scenarios involving oil and fossil fuels of being able to capture that with no environmental impact, ultimately also at low cost. Uh, and those also have thousands of times more uh, potential we need. You can go down a mile or two this way, geothermal is a tremendous amount of heat inside the earth. Uh, that can be turned into energy. Uh, there's a whole set of different scenarios, any one of which could uh, meet our needs actually thousands of times over uh, in a clean, renewable way that does not release uh, gases like carbon dioxide. Okay, great. I think it's uh, very important to realize that some of the things you talk about, which might seem like science fiction to us, but these are, uh, some of them are already in the beginning stages and they are actually developing, like the Google goggles, for example, the glasses. Um, this is, I guess, a question for both of you. Uh, will the development in technology create a larger divide between the rich and poor countries? Uh, this touches upon what you were talking just uh, about. Well, sometimes you hear that. Uh, I think all the evidence is that it is uh, actually eliminating the divide. Uh, take Asia as a very good example. Uh, many societies there were very poor agrarian societies, which basically used old-fashioned farming methods 20 years ago and today have thriving information economies. Uh, the developing world actually has a higher growth rate than the developed world today. Africa has a higher, much higher growth rate than the United States. Uh, and technology is coming in. Uh, Internet is becoming quite common. 30% of Africans have cell phones. Most of those will be smartphones very soon. A kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to more information and knowledge than the President of the United States did uh, 15 years ago. Uh, there's right now very high quality education being put online for free from the best educational institutions of the world. So anybody with an internet connection can actually access the best education. Uh, so I think there's tremendous potential ultimately to overcome the have, have not uh, divide. And if you look at the economic statistics, that is happening. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, and at any one point in time, there is a divide. If you looked at my education graph, uh, the number of, the amount of education we're giving children is increasing everywhere in the world, but there is a divide. And the divide stays there, but both uh, developed and developing nations are moving in the right direction. Also, developing nations can literally leapfrog into the future. It took decades to wire America and wire Europe. Today, we don't have to wire these cities. We can simply go wireless. Plus, the European cities and the American cities have an aging infrastructure. The subway system in New York City, where I live, is 100 years old. In London, it's even older than that. Beijing has a brand new subway system leapfrogging over the, the European and the American nations. So the advantage there is clear. However, I think there's also a warning there. The world economy is making a slow but historic transition from commodity capitalism to intellectual capitalism. Those nations that are stuck in certain commodities like food could see their wealth gradually disappear. Uh, food prices are extremely low compared to historic levels. Uh, this morning, you had breakfast that the King of England could not have had 100 years ago. Think of what you had for breakfast. 
The king of England could not have had these delicacies from around the world. That's how cheap food is historically from the past. So those nations that put all their eggs in agriculture without investing in information, without investing in entertainment and software, they could see their national wealth get smaller and smaller. Other nations like China have taken advantage of this. They send their students overseas where, where I see them. The Cuspia program in China takes the top scientists, the cream of the cream of the cream of the cream, and they send them to the United States. I'm, I'm part of the Cuspia program, and I see these physicists go back to China to create a laser industry, a microelectronics industry, a biotech industry from nothing, from nothing. These people are sent to the United States, go back to China to create whole industries. Wow. Uh, this is a question for you, uh, Dr. Macheo. Um, a question from Haider Al Ansari. He says, when do you think we will witness the transition from type zero civilization to one like Flash Gordon, type one? <laughs> We physicists rank civilizations by energy, and a type 1 civilization is planetary. That is, they control the weather, they control earthquakes, they control volcanoes, that's type 1. Then there's type 2, like Star Trek, where they control the energy of a star, or a few stars. That's like the Federation of Planets. Then there's type 3, which is galactic, like the Empire of Star Wars. So on that scale, what are we? Do we play with the weather? Do we play with stars? Or do we play with galaxies? We are type zero. We get our energy from dead plants. However, you get a calculator, and you calculate at what point will we use up all the energy that comes from the sun. It's a very simple calculation. It's about 100 years. And you can see the beginnings of a type one civilization every time you open the newspaper. Uh, the birth pangs of type one. Uh, a type one language is being created. The two major languages on the internet are English and Mandarin. A type one sports with soccer and football and the Olympics. Mm -hmm. A type one economy with NAFTA, the European Union. A type one youth culture with rock and roll. A type one high culture with uh, Chanel and, and uh, Louis Vuitton. And so we're seeing the beginning of a planetary civilization, and local cultures will exist simultaneously. We will be bilingual. We will have the local culture, and we will have the planetary culture, and we'll go back and forth between the local culture and the planetary culture. But we're about 100 years from being a fully type 1 civilization. Okay, you got your answer then. Um, this is a question to Mr. Ray, and I guess both of you can chip in. Uh, do you think that the word, uh, the word, uh, word cult culture will disappear given that technology will dissolve uh, geographical boundaries? Well, I think, uh, and actually building on what Michio just said, uh, we see a world culture emerging uh, which has as, as its input uh, all of the different cultures of the world. Uh, because people now can communicate with people that have common interests all around the world. And I see children in the United States communicating with people in, in Africa and the Arab world and China uh, and making friends with them and understanding their culture and appreciating their music. And uh, if you look at musical interests, it's definitely being influenced by everything going on uh, in other musical cultures. Uh, so we have a, a worldwide culture because we have worldwide communication already. Uh, and I think that needs to be based on tolerance of appreciating uh, the beauty and wisdom of, of many different cultures and different histories and uh, different ways of looking at the world, which I think can only make uh, our world richer. Uh, but we truly have world communication now, which is bringing about a uh, a world culture which is very rich and diverse uh, and will continue to expand in diversity. Also, wherever I go speak around the world, I need a bilingual elite. The elites are fluent in English or a European language and the local culture. That's today we have a bilingual elite. In the future, it will be bicultural. There will be a planetary civilization 
Uh, you can see that every time you just uh, open the TV and you see the Olympics, the beginning of a planetary culture. But the local cultures will live forever. They live forever on the internet. The culture, the language, the artwork will be stored forever on the internet, and local cultures will flourish and interact and enrich the planetary culture. So just like the elites of today are bilingual, in the future, everybody will be bicultural. Okay. Uh, one last question, because we're running out of time for uh, Dr. Macheo. Um, how vulnerable are we of using technology? Do we have enough protection? Enough protection. Yeah, so I'm assuming... <laughs> well, um, technology is a double-edged sword. It yeah. depends on who controls the sword. Uh, take a look at the development of uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, on one hand, nuclear bombs can destroy society. On the other hand, well, maybe with fusion power, we'll have clean, cheap, inexhaustible, unlimited amounts of power through, through fusion. But the key is more and more democratic debate. The key is everyone has to be part of this discussion. Definitely. And as democracy spreads, wars are lessened. Uh, no two democracies have ever warred with each other in history. All the great wars of the past have been between dictatorships and, and monarchies. So as democracy spreads, I think wars will also be lessened. Okay. Uh, I've actually written quite a bit about this double-edged uh, nature of technology. Uh, one of the chapters of Singularities Near is called The Int Deeply Intertwined Promise versus Peril of GNR, which is Genetics, Nanotechnology, and Robotics. And a very good example is take biotechnology. So we talk today about how biotechnology is going to enable us to reprogram our, bi our biology away from cancer and away from heart disease, you know, good things. Uh, the same technology could be used by a bioterrorist in a routine college bioengineering laboratory to take a flu virus and reprogram it to be more deadly, more communicable, more stealthy, and create a super weapon uh, and create a great deal of destruction. And it's a complicated, so some people actually have called for a relinquishment. Let's not pursue advanced technology at all because of these dangers. Uh, I've written that that would be a bad idea because basically we would just drive the technologies underground where they'd be even more dangerous. Uh, I think what we need to do is actually recognize the problem and develop defenses against that. I've actually worked with the U.S. Army on that, and we have today a rapid response system where if someone tried to do what I just said, we would detect it very quickly. We can now sequence a biological virus in one day. HIV took five years, SARS took 31 days. We can now do it in one day create a uh, medication against that, RNA interference medication or an antigen-based vaccine in one day, and within a few days have a, an antidote. So we could talk you know, all day about the technical details of that, but society needs to put a high priority on keeping these technologies safe. You know, fire kept us warm, but also burned down our villages. Technology has always been a double-edged sword. Uh, I think we've benefited more than we've been hurt uh, but we actually have to focus our priorities and energy on keeping these technologies safe and, and preparing uh, for defenses against people who would be irresponsible. Okay, well, thank you very much again for being here and uh, answering our questions. With that, we come to the end of our session, and we would like to thank you for attending and participating, and we hope to meet soon in future sessions of the Muntada organized by Sheikh Salama bin Hamdan Al-Nahyan Foundation.